Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad that you're here and my very warm and very special welcome is to our colleagues from Croatia. <laughs> I'm so astonished to see you to see you here participate in this in this course. Dear participants, what I can give you here is just a short insight of what we have. It's really nothing in terms of quantity, but you will be uh, somehow impressed, I dare to say it. What do we have here in our special collections? In our department we have about 2200 manuscripts. The majority of them, so let's say 80% or a little bit more, are medieval manuscripts. The rest are modern manuscripts. So we have modern manuscripts, that means uh, even 18th century. And uh, I will present you one which is very interesting from the 18th century. So uh, handwritten books would not end uh, with, 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 with uh, emerging of prints. Then we have uh, 1100 uh, incunabula. You know, these are the earliest prints up to the year 1500. That's quite a lot. So in terms of quantity of manuscripts and of incunabula, we are ranked second place in Austria. That's fantastic, but it's a huge burden. And it is very difficult to uh, write detailed catalogues with, all, uh, with everything what is necessary to, to describe. And it is far more difficult and much more work to encode what we find in any of these manuscripts or uh, early printed books. So, 11, uh, 2,200 manuscripts, 1,100, so half of it, uh, of that number uh, in Kunabula, and then we have about uh, 13,000, 13,500 uh, uh, early prints from the 16th century. And then the number of uh, uh, books we have of the 17th and 18th and 19th century, it's, it's, it's enormous. So we have a totality of uh, more than 200,000 books, which we count among the rare books. So our collection ends actually with the year 1900. Please take a seat. It is not necessary to... to <laughs> We are not in church and I'm not a bishop. <laughs> what I want to uh, show you and give an introduction, an impression to you is about the history of the book. And of course, I will mention here and there uh, what are the difficulties when you are going to encode this or that reality, which we might see in this or that book. So, on the one hand, it is a, a ride through the history of bookmaking. On the other hand, I want to hint at some aspects which might be difficult or which might be a challenge uh, when you're uh, going to encode this or that reality of the book. Hmm? This, uh, I, I hope that I will meet uh, your uh, expectations and uh, let's see. I will start with the very oldest texts we have in our collection. It is one uh, papyrus, one papyrus. Everybody has seen a papyrus all, uh, so far? Yeah? All of them? Yeah. That's Asterix and Obelix. That's the garment of Obelix, yeah? No, not true. For sure we can explain it in a better way. You may have a look. On this side we have a text that's more important. So we do not have really many of such debris here in our collection, about 60, not more. How did we get uh, such, such, such a papari in, uh, to our collection? How could we add them here? Graz is very far from the place where they, where they came from. They are from Egypt. 
It was uh, by the end of the 19th century, in the first, uh, first uh, uh, 10 years of the 20th century, that there were uh, very uh, many British expedi scientific expeditions going to, uh, going to Egypt. But at a certain point they ran out of money. And in old towns over Europe they tried to get money. And the mayor of Graz was ready to finance something. And as a reward, as a thank you, we received a bundle, really a bundle, a handful of uh, papyri, not more, and therefore we have them. Otherwise, really, uh, if we have 60 or 50, uh, 58 or so, uh, it is really nothing, really nothing. Yeah? The Sackler Library in Oxford has about 50, 500,000 to 600,000. It's an estimate. So, uh, but it is very interesting what we can find on papyri. Actually, these are fragments. So, if you are going to encode a papyrus, in normal cases, in the normal case, uh, you will have to encode a fragment. That's difficult. Since you, uh, in, uh, as it is uh, here uh, with this fragment, you have two, uh, two faces, back and uh, recto and verso, and uh, one is with uh, colors only, and the rest, uh, the other side, with text. And from the text, you do not know the ending of the line, and you do not know the beginning of the line. You even do not know sometimes where the word ends. And that's one of the difficulties of reading, uh, of reading uh, such ancient texts. This, uh, this papyrus here is written in Greek. They did not make, at that time when they, those texts were written, they did not make uh, distances between the words. So you have to, to know your uh, the vocabulary and the grammar quite, well, quite, quite well in order to find out even where a word ends and where another word begins. Not to speak about, about uh, some additional marks which would, which, would ease, uh, which would make it easy for you to read a text. But we managed it. Some, uh, at a certain time we had a, we had a seminary here in these rooms, so three years uh, before or four, no, it's more, five years before. We had, uh, we had a group of students, 12 students, uh, this size of group we had here, in order to read to read uh, 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 papyrological texts. And they managed it after a week. Really, everybody, they could Greek to some extent. Of course, they were students of ancient history. And uh, so we used this material for training purposes and for demonstration, of course. What can we learn out from such texts? You can imagine there are, uh, there are two general traditions in papyrology, papyrology. The one tradition is the literary text, the big scrolls and the great uh, comprehensive texts of, of, the tragedy, of the Greek tragedies, of the Coptic, I do not know what, of the history, uh, historians, and so on and so on. So the, these lit so-called literary texts, you can believe it, the majority, the vast majority, of this text category is studied. What is not yet studied, or only to some very few extent, are the, the rest of the texts, all those fragments. They do not give you much information. And normally, in normal cases, these are not, uh, these are not long texts telling you a story. No. We have here, we have here uh, in our collection, we have one uh, list, five words and some numbers. This is a list of products you might uh, uh, buy on the market. But it is interesting. Of course, it's not important from the literary point of view. That's not a quality of text, but it gives you information about a reality of daily life. So we can learn what could they have on the market and how much did a beer co cost? What was the overall cost of a beer or anything? Of course, if you only have one 
of these fragments, it's not really telling you a story or uh, the daily life, but we have tens of thousands of such uh, uh, materials. And these fragments are called non-literary texts. And those texts, there are actually all uh, papyrologists worldwide are working on such corpuses of, 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 of uh, 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 fragmented texts. And putting them together, thematically of course, uh, you will get an impression of daily life. And this is why we have, uh, why I like, why I like to show such a, uh, such a fragment. And uh, finally, uh, what I, uh, what I uh, told you is the uh, color of Obelix's uh, uh, garment. It is, what do you think what it is? It gives us another, another information, from, uh, namely from where we can get additional texts even today. There are coffins from mummies. And at the beginning the mummies were, were, uh, uh, were uh, well, covered with, 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 with this, uh, tissues and fabrics of, of any kind, but it was too expensive from the Pythagorean time onward, so let's say roughly third century onward, before Christ onward, uh, they used uh, uh, waste material from papyri. Then uh, they substituted uh, the more expensive tissue by such debris, and uh, then they uh, made it flat and, and, and colored it and, and so. And now in, in modern times we are able to, uh, to uh, separate this layer, layer by layer. And sometimes we discover under the surface of a former coffin, uh, we uh, discover a Greek text. So you will never end discovering uh, papyric texts. So that was for the beginning. But I'm hurrying to the, to the uh, later texts. Now I'm uh, presenting uh, to you something what, uh, what I chose because it, uh, it is the form of the book which is not quite common or ordinary. It is the book scroll. Everybody has seen book scrolls so far? Yeah? Book scroll is very interesting, of course, since what we have here does not have the form of a book as you see it here in the sh on the shelves. But actually it is the same, but it is quite uh, organized in, just in another way. What we have here is a book scroll, I mentioned it. And you can see it, it's uh, made of parchment. You can see it, the, uh, the pieces are sewn together. You may, you may touch it, you may touch it, of course. <laughs> But not the writing itself. <laughs> no, I will, I will show. I will just demonstrate here uh, the sewing. The, there are rectangular pieces of parchment, which which are sewn together. Yeah. Here you see the sewing, and you can uh, you can uh, imagine uh, the scroll has a length according to the needs of the text, how much text uh, you would have to put on it. That's the length of the, of the scroll, of course. Can you, can you, do you have an idea of uh, uh, what is the length of the longest book scroll we have? Just guess. How many meters? Hmm? Oh, that's too much, that's too much. <laughs> it is 45 meter. 45, here you see it is sewn together. Yeah? So, 45 meters, the Papyrus Bodmer, which is actually in Berlin, I think, and it is a, a hieroglyphic uh, text, a medical text. And of course, you cannot write in uh, the, the organization of, uh, how, uh, of how to place text on a book scroll. Uh, may, be, uh, uh, may have uh, different variants. And one variant is to write the text in this way. And this gives us uh, uh, an idea of how the, uh, this scroll was used. 
it is, uh, it is red and red and red, and you open it and open it and open it. Then you turn it over, half time, you turn it over, since the back side is, uh, uh, you, you will write, uh, find write, uh, written text here as well. And then you uh, bring it to the uh, initial state. So you are at the end when you have read the full text uh, as you have it uh, had in, uh, at the beginning. So, this was the very common form of the book before the, this form of the codex emerged. But actually it is the same. I mentioned it, it is just organized in a different way. If I may take this, this, this piece of paper, may I? One? Thank you, Sandra. So, uh, there is one, uh, one rectangular uh, piece of parchment, let's say. And then you have another one. And you are sewing it and sewing it. It's a book scroll. But actually, if you uh, do not sew them, the pieces together, but you make a staple of it, of those uh, pieces, then you get something which is similar to a book. You fold it in order to protect it. So, and, one, two, and, and, and finally you have a choir and more choirs. And finally, at the end, you will, uh, you will conserve trying to protect it a bit more. You will envelop it with a, with a cover of any kind. Uh, first of all, leather and then uh, wood and uh, leather with wood and, 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 and. So that's the development of the book and that's the one. So actually, you see, the material is the same, rectangular pieces, but organized in a quite different way. What we have here is a, is a book scroll of Georgian origin. It's in Georgian language, which is spoken in Caucasian Georgia. It's not from America, please. It's not. <laughs> it is uh, from the Caucasus region and it's a liturgical text. Uh, so it is very, uh, and you see it is much stained and it is not, not that clean. Yeah? And, it, 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 it even smells a, a little bit and not, not very fine. So, but the text of it is, it, it, it is, is described and published. It's available online and it is uh, published in 1915 in printed form. What is interesting here, how to describe a scroll, a book scroll. If you're encoding this reality of a book, the materiality is difficult since you have missing pieces. You have illustrations or decor, uh, decorative mo uh, elements. So you have to dis uh, describe it. You have a uh, head as in red color. You have two different, uh, you have two different uh, 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 kinds of letters, capital letters and non-capital letters. They are taken from two different uh, scripts, Georgian scripts. The capital letters are the older ones. And the name of this uh, uh, script is Asomta Vruli. You will need it for your life. I'm quite sure. Asomta Vruli. <laughs> so this, the, uh, these are the oldest texts of Georgian origin we actually have, uh, which are written in this alphabet. There are only five, uh, five books worldwide uh, which are known to be written in this uh, uh, majuscule uh, 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 alphabet. And one of them is here. And therefore, all people who are working on uh, Georgian texts and Georgian heritage are coming to Graz in order to see this book. This is dating from the 6th century, 6th century. So that's more than five, uh, 1500 years old. So that's old Georgian in Asomta Ruli script. So, you have to encode this. It's a difficult task. Since you have no margins, you easily can see the text is cut. It's very frequent with manuscripts. Okay, how do you describe uh, 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 cut manuscripts? They are trimmed in on the margins. Hmm? 1500 years at least. First line you can see easily see okay there's text missing. Mm -hmm. For the camera uh, 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 man, it's difficult that I'm moving, huh? 
but life is not always that easy. Excuse, excuse me. <laughs> So, this is the beginning of the uh, history of codices which we have in our collection. And then we have some very nice pieces. In the, gutter, in the fold here, we will discover here and there, as it is the case here, such stripes of parchment. And they are written with uh, Greek letters. Very ancient, very ancient they, they, they too. They are from Mount Sinai, from the uh, St. Catherine's Monastery there. So, if you are going to encode this manuscript or the, the piece of a book, it is very difficult. The, the book itself is a fragment. It's only part of a book, so five or six choirs. And then in these uh, remnants of a book, you will find fragments of Greek origin. But the expert e easily can see this is a Greek, these are Greek letters from Mount Sinai. That's a very typical way of writing at that place. Hmm? So, you have to deal with fragments again. If you are going to work when you are encoding text, if you are going uh, to work in historic libraries, you will always discover fragments. Fragments of early prints, fragments of uh, parchments, fragments of any kind. It's also worth pointing out that right now, of course, what's called fragmentology is a really live and uh, very interesting issue within the encoding world in specifically medieval manuscripts. Um, but also, one of the things that we would like to talk about, although it's actually very up in the air right now with the Text Encoding Initiative Consortium, is how do we treat manuscript materials like this that are included within the same packaging uh, within TEI files. Um, and of course this varies very much from institution to institution for cataloging. Here for example, Semmelbende manuscripts, manuscripts that are bound together have different catalog numbers, whereas others would have one catalog number. And the TEI consortium currently is trying to decide how we are treating objects with different histories that are either conceptually the same object or have been separated from each other. And that's something that we will uh, briefly talk about in my MS description module uh, that we will have on Friday. So uh, it's a really uh, interesting set of objects for talking about those issues. Well, it is uh, actually it's not really difficult, but it's uh, it's getting uh, more and more complex. If you're dealing with such uh, kinds of objects, it is complex, and you will have in your die a uh, guidebook in the handbook of your uh, in the guidelines. Uh, you will you will have to uh, to look uh, where will uh, what what feature is it what I have to use in order to uh, to describe this or that reality. But please, fragments are always necessary. You may find them and you will find them for sure working in historic libraries. It's clear. Uh, you know why? Uh, all the parchment pieces have been uh, used for repairing purposes, for uh, covering, for covers for stabiliz uh, stabilizing uh, uh, the binding and, 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 and. So you may find uh, the, 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 the written fragment, uh, text, uh, fragments with text on it and, uh, at every place in a, in, a, in a historic book, even in a printed book. So you can, you can imagine a, a, a printed book of paper, made of paper, if it is made of paper, then uh, in, the, in the gutter where, uh, where the, the, the choir is sewn, it may uh, break. In order to uh, stabilize this uh, uh, dangerous area in a book, 
They reinforced it with the help of stripes of parchment. And sometimes we are able to reconstruct a full page from the stripes which were used in the book. And it helps us, since fragments in normal cases gives us the information of an otherwise completely lost book. Well, and sometimes we get quite, quite interesting uh, information about, uh, about uh, the book itself, about the book history and so on. But these, these are realities you might consider if you want to uh, encode uh, the entity of a book. And it's a very, very complex entity, be it a scroll or a fragment or, or, or such a codex. What I have to show you now is one of my favorite objects. It's really one of my favorite objects, but I, I would never want to describe it in an encoded form. <laughs> I would not like it, really not. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad that we are group, uh, working in a group of, 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 of uh, uh, glagolitic researchers and I have the honor to, 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 to work with them uh, and encoding such, uh, such, uh, such curious books. It's not curious, actually, it's a missile. So, uh, but uh, this, what we have here, is really curious. It's, uh, you know, everybody of you uh, uh, knows the expression palimpsest. Palimpsest. Huh? Everybody knows what it is. Nobody knows it, really. <laughs> Since the expression, the expression palimpsest is very common and very frequent, frequent uh, actually in, 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 in nearly all scientific areas. Sigmund Freud used it. So what is in psychological sense a, a, some palimpsest actually? What it, it, we uh, in literature, uh, literature sciences and, 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 and in other areas of research we will find this expression. It is always the K, uh, used when there are two different layers of something are overlapping. And the one layer is transparent uh, through the other. So actually you have two different uh, layers of entities, of realities, which are over. So how, how do you describe, how do you encode it? Come on. It is not difficult to, uh, not really uh, easy, I guess, to, 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 to encode uh, the, 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 the reality of a palimpsest. And there are palimpsests uh, which are rewritten four times. Four times. Can you imagine? How, how can you, you can deal with one layer with the, with the other one and it's, it's endless work. <laughs> so, but uh, what we have here is, is fantastic in that sense that it is uh, uh, in the moment, so at present, it is, uh, it is a challenge uh, tech, uh, for technical uh, development. We have, the, uh, we have the emergence of uh, multispectral imaging. And this, in combination with artificial intel intelligence, would make it easier to, we think in many cases, to make readable a text which was effaced hundreds, uh, hundreds of years ago. So this is, this is the question. So it's a technical, technical challenge. And if you're working with such a manuscript, you will use whatever is helpful for you, or uh, whatever would be promising for you to make a text readable. So you easily can see, without any instrument or any technical help, that there are two text layers. Yeah, they are perpendicular, mm -hmm. the lines, the lines here. So you see the text here. Worldwide, it is said that there are are approximately 30,000 folios which are palimpsest are not yet read. Okay. 
can easily see. Mm -hmm. So we have a text which was effaced and which was overwritten at a later date. And it is fantastic to read the first text which was effaced, of course, but you will not come uh, uh, to an end uh, within 15 days. It's not uh, a rush, uh, result you would, you would achieve. This is a category of book which is not really that rare as you might uh, expect. We have many, many objects which are very interesting, but encoding such uh, complex, multi-layered uh, multi realities, it's, it's really a difficult task. And I can imagine that it that will really come to the borders of what we can do or should do if we are doing draining uh, this with uh, here, um, encoding with here, such text. So, by the way, the first text is the first uh, effaced text was uh, Armenian. The second text is uh, Georgian, and the the Armenian text is a book of oracles which was a forbidden book, by the way, from the church, of course, forbidden. And uh, it is, might be one of the reasons why the text has, has been thrown away. So they, they, they wanted to reuse uh, the parchment, the material of the previous book, and uh, then uh, they washed away. They cleaned the first text. That's, isn't it fun, fantastic, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you have in your special collection palimpsest? By the way, everybody among us is producing palimpsests or has produced a palimpsest in his life, his or her life. When you are re reading the Rabbah in your school, uh, in the school on the exercise, and uh, you are uh, deleting a text with the help of a Rabbah and you are overwriting this, uh, this blank uh, now then uh, you are producing a, um, a palimpsest, of course. So it's, it's, it's a common uh, feature, palimpsest. The text, the first text, was uh, effaced around the year 800. So we are coming close to the uh, uh, second millennium. I'm using these pieces since when we are dealing with uh, historical manuscripts and they are bound in many cases, in most cases, then we will have a problem if we open a book 180 uh, degree. So it is difficult, we, are, we would destroy or at least we might harm uh, the cover and the binding. And therefore, it is one of the methods to avoid these damages, to not open it fully. What I have to show you here is, again, a very difficult object. Everybody uh, has, a st has an idea of Latin language and Latin alphabet, yeah? Hmm? Should be the case, huh? It's, uh, it's not an examination, come on. <laughs> but here we have a very curious uh, manuscript again, which is very difficult to describe codicologically. So from the material point of view, since the or organization of the text in four columns, four, that's a lot, huh? But if you, if, you dis, uh, if you compare those text columns, we have four times one and the same. What's, what's going on here? Why did one write one and the same text in four different versions 
And if you compare those texts, you will <coughs> easily see that the majority of words are, are identical. The wording is nearly the same, except every now and then some variants, very small variants, not dramatic. This is a huge book. We have 200 folios. This, that's, that's a costly book, expensive. And why write down, put down four times one and the same text, three times in Latin and a fourth time in Latin characters, but not in Latin language? Can you, can you imagine how you would encode this? Really difficult, huh? I mean, it's time-consuming. It's, it's time-consuming, is essential. It's time-consuming, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you get to choose which way to do it. It gets essentially more and more complex, uh, and you have to decide whether or not it's worth it. And that's something we will talk about on uh, Friday. Yeah, uh, but uh, I'm just uh, hinting at uh, what might be uh, a really complex and a challenge. So. Uh, here we have uh, the right column is always the Greek text of what is in Latin in, in three other versions here. So we are in the mid of the ninth. I would just like to also invite the people who are all the way in the back. If you want to come up closer for the ones you, you may, you may, you may the... approach if you, if you want. And everybody may read, <laughs> of course, since everybody knows the Latin alphabet. We are using it. But please go ahead, sorry. So you may, we may put it closer here. I have never seen Greek in Latin script. That's a very interesting phenome phenomenon. Since we, 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 we find this phenomenon in many cases, always in all cultures, actually, we have it where there are two languages and different scripts, or only one script, overlapping. So, let, let me take the, 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 sample, the example of, uh, of Kurdish language, Kurds. You know the Kurds. Huh? They were in the Middle East at home, but never had an own alphabet. They have a, a, an own uh, proper uh, language. But always, really always used the uh, alphabets of the region. They were writing the Kurdish language in Syriac, in Arabic, in Persian, in Armenian, in Turkish, and others. So they didn't have a proper alphabet. So they had what they, what they heard or what they spoke, they uh, put it down in a not appropriate alphabet. This is called allography. Allos, another, and graphene is to write in Greek. Allography, it's a very, but it is an interesting phenomenon. You can, you can, uh, you can, uh, from this allographies, you might learn how in a specific situation, a language has been pronounced and spoken. So in m some of these manuscripts of that kind, we can learn how they spoke. Not only how they did write, but how they spoke. Since, as it is the case here, we have a phonetic notation of words. The person who has put down the Greek text in Latin characters, allographic, had no idea of Greek language. But this person, possibly, uh, probably it was a he in the mid uh, 10th century, uh, uh, this person heard a word and put it down in written form, heard the same word after an hour and wrote it down in a different way. Had no idea of Greek grammar, had no idea of word endings and made contractions which, uh, of words which made 
make no sense at all. So we have here actually uh, the, the fantastic, the fantastic uh, um, source of speaking. And we can hear them from reading. In my Latin school, where I learned Latin a little bit, there was the question, there was the question, uh, was the name Cicero or Cicero? How, how, how was it pronounced? It's a classic question. We do not find, uh, find the word Kikaro and Cicero here, since it is, it, it, these are theologic texts. These, it, it's the psalm book and some, and some, uh, some anthems, some chants. But from such a, a kind of texts, we may decide the question of how they pronounced. I'll give you another sample. It, this is not just for encoding, this is for, being, uh, for, for giving you another, another example. In, uh, if you, if you, uh, nowadays, if you hear Georgian chant, it's Latin, huh? Georgian, Georgian chant, it is, um, you hear uh, always jelly for heaven. It's not curly or celi or keli. As, you, uh, as classical Latin would have said, or would you expect, but you will hear celi, j. It's completely different from, from C or, or K. I, had, I have written in Yerevan, I saw a, a, an Armenian manuscript. There I got an answer to such a question. I always thought, uh, okay, this is the, the modern, the modern 20th century and 21st century uh, way of, of, of pronouncing uh, Latin words. From this manuscript of the 13th or 14th century, it is Yerevan 7117. In this manuscript, you will find passages of Latin texts written in Armenian characters. And there you have the word horologia. Hora is the stunde, logia is uh, what, you, what you know about. Horologia. This, might, uh, this can be calendar or it doesn't, not, doesn't know what, uh, uh, was it, uh, what, what the translation is. But horologia, the Latin word, and it was uh, written there in, as horologia. In Armenian alphabet, we have 36 letters, a great variety, of course, and we have a, a proper letter for j. So it is quite clear, it is a phonetic way of putting down a text. A person heard the text and from hearing wrote it uh, down on, 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 on parchment. So this is not an invention of the 20th century as, uh, as I expected or as I thought it would be, but uh, such developments to pronounce the Latin language according to the Italian fashion, all'italienne. We would say all'italienne, huh? On the Italian, uh, 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 à la française, uh, uh, all'italienne. Uh, as we hear Italian language now. So it's not modern. It was already uh, on the way in medieval days. So that's, that's the emerging of, uh, and the development of languages and so on. So this is what we can learn from such curious books here. So let, let us have a short break, is it okay?